A very warm welcome to all of you. We're really pleased to have you here today at our virtual conference. And we hope you've enjoyed the first session, should you have attended the same. Our topic for this panel is Hidden and Vulnerable, Promoting Decent Working Conditions for Home-Based Workers. We're going to focus today on the unique challenges of understanding, identifying, and managing home-based workers in the supply chain. Some house rules as we go ahead with the webinar. All participants are on mute to facilitate an efficient session. We will have a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar, and you can enter all your questions in the chat window as we go through the webinar. And you can also specify who your question is directed towards as you type in the question. We would also like to gather your experience, your views, uh, you know, as we uh, go ahead with the webinar. And for the same, we are going to use an app called Sledo. So you may either have the app already, Sledo, or you could go to the website, www.sledo.com. So it's, it's right here again, sledo.com. Um, do pull it up on your phones um, or on your laptops because we would be really eager to hear what uh, views you have to share as we go ahead with the questions. We're going to gather some inputs via polls and Q&As. And as you pull up the website, uh, you can use this code for our uh, session today, hash 69126. So I repeat it again, hash 69126. We have lovely speakers joining us today from different corners of the world, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. So we have Jean Johnson, who is the Goodweave Director of Apparels and Accessories. Mm -hmm. We also have with us Shanaz Rafiq. She's a trade union organizer, trainer, and leader from India. And we have Lucy Brill, who is the Director of Homeworkers Worldwide. And myself, who's going to moderate it, Natasha Majumdar, Network Representative for India, and Fori. So I now would like to request all of you to turn towards Slido. Again, www.slido.com and use the, hash, the code hash69126. As you enter this in, the first question we have for you is, are you aware of home-based workers in your supply chain? We'd like to gather your inputs on, are you aware of home-based workers in your supply chain? To give you perspective, this is the app. It, it pulls up and you'll be able to see a question shortly while on the app or the website. Please do share with us your responses. I'll pause for a moment as we gather your inputs. And I am just assimilating the same as you enter your details. Interestingly, at the end of this, you will also yourself on the app or the website be able to see the results of the question. Okay, thank you for all your responses. Um, as we gather this, we will share with you the inputs that we have at the end of, uh, towards the end of the webinar, just before the Q&A. Uh, but I close this question for now, and we move ahead to the next question. What risks do you associate with home-based workers in your supply chain?
give you a moment here to enter in your responses. The question again is, what risks do you associate with home-based workers in your supply chain? Thank you everyone for your participation and your inputs. I now close this question and we will gather the inputs to share with you again towards the end. And as this actually comes together, I am very happy to, to share today and to go into details of um, you know, the challenges and really the risks that lie in uh, home-based workers. And in this regards, I would like to turn to Shanaz. Uh, Shanaz uh, is joining us uh, from New Delhi in India. And Shanaz, may I actually request you to, you know, highlight for us the key human rights violations as well as the challenges in home-based work. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Natasha, for taking the initiative and being such a wonderful moderator. I would first of all like to thank Amphory for organizing this digital webinar um, and talking about the most hidden and the most vulnerable um, workers who are the home-based workers. And today we would be talking about promoting decent working conditions for the home-based workers. We all know the present scenario of these home-based workers and how this pandemic is affecting them by and large. You could be seeing uh, in the slide also across that hunger is looming large. And the biggest challenge today for these home-based workers who are the most vulnerable, who are the most uh, um, desperate and devastated community today across the globe, also in India. And the largest challenge today for them is the livelihood, the food security, the job security, the income security, their social security. This is the largest, the biggest challenge here also in India. But adding on to the agony today, what we find here in India is that the present state gov uh, central government is squashing the laws. And there is uh, no one to talk about their right to live, right to food, right to livelihood. And hence comes the um, devastating condition of these workers when they start migrating from their uh, place of work towards their hometown, stranded in millions and millions, dying because of food and hunger and water and no um, facilities being provided by the central government. Reforming labor markets have suspended the key laws which lead to debasement of the labor rights also and intensifying the informality and the precarity and exploitation. Multiple labor market issues like employment, health, safety, skills have weakened and there is nil incomes. So what uh, as trade unions we find that these home-based workers who have who are hidden ones they are not known they don't know they are they are themselves invisible working for the visible products working for the invisible employers they don't know about their employers also so does the global chain supply workers have stomach definitely they need they need food they need occupational health and safety and they need a job security, which is at plight at this present pandemic. Added uh, on, let me also not forget, these home-based workers are in large numbers and a larger chunk force are the women chunk force who are working maybe at ready-made garments, maybe with, for leather, maybe for tannery, in uh, artificial jewelry, 
uh, and also footwear. And they are girls in the front and center of the COVID response and recovery. So economic opportunities, education, and domestic gender norms should be the area of focus now. There is no data available for these home-based workers yet. And we should have a sex dis uh, aggregated data. Women play an outsized role in this crisis in the healthcare, in the social worker side, domestic worker size, home based worker size, mobilizers of the communities. Hence, there must be a gender lens also on the response of this COVID. Now, this indifferent governments with policymakers and social uh, attitude, both at the origin of the country where the uh, products are from and at the receiving country where they are making. Even the United Nations says that it can have a huge knock on effects on the women health and specifically women's sexual, mental and reproductive health is being at stake. We are seeing how COVID-19 highlights global neglect of women. We have to safeguard the maternal, sexual and reproductive health also, prioritize the gender equality in health system, tackle the gender-based violence and maintain an access to education and health protect the economic opportunities uh, most of the states around 12 states in india are freezing up these labor laws and this will add to their agony they are losing their livelihood there is no remittance there is stress on care and um, home-based workers lack of social production and health care limited freedom of movement violence and discrimination at the core irrespective of the uh, migration status also they should enjoy their rights the human rights all human rights workers rights are human rights so they should have access to health to police to justice and to social services also now what measures are being taken uh, is uh, very difficult to say leaving aside some of the trade unions and some uh, small uh, NGOs and CSOs who are feeding these migrant stranded home-based workers and migrant workers on their path and trying to see that they try to sustain, but this is not sufficient. We are lacking uh, in statutes. We are lacking in weak regulatory uh, system mechanism and providing impunity uh, to the employers and agents and the contractors furthermore. So what we as trade unions are also looking forward to why not we uh, develop some helpline numbers for these migrant workers and these and the role of the manrega scheme that we have in india that 100 days of job security should be available at their hometown let us increase that 100 days to 200 days let the state the central government provide a, a amount of at least 10000 to the marginalized and the vulnerable people who are returning back to their uh, hometowns so that at least they can sustain themselves for one or two months. Why not we talk about investing more on the MSMEs and the small scale industries so that more job is created at the hometowns instead of giving loans, the central government, which is planning to give, trying to give loans to these MSMEs, small scale industries and um, the macro and uh, mini, uh, many small scale industries why not we uh, the central government provides them economic empowerment which will also generate some job for these migrant and stranded uh, workers at their hometowns we have to jointly hand to hand work with the civil societies and concerned citizens and a good opportunity over here is to register these home based workers these migrant workers who are uh, returning back and try to form cooperative societies for these organizations, which would further add uh, to the benefit as we would be having a data with them. We would be having their accounts details. Let's not forget that this global supply chain will be at stake as people will buy from the local products further. Impact of COVID will be more devastating than the Great Depressions of the 1930 and millions of jobs will be lost. There will be realignment of market forces in terms of global production and supply. Hence, the credibility of the trust of the employers is much needed to save their own market. And this pandemic has made people realize also, it has shown the limitations of the consumerization. 
there will be a realignment of the consumption pattern of the society also so we have to rediscover the market rediscover the ethical values demand and ensure workers in the supply chain are paid no wages have been paid from march most of the majority of the brands have not even paid to them so we have to ensure that the workers in the supply chain are paid isn't it the responsibility let's there be an honest stock taking during this pandemic and uh, what generally applies to the medium and small scale enterprises applies to the home based workers in supply chain also brands can ensure that the employers workers can form cooperatives so that brands have access to their bank details of these workers these vulnerable uh, workers these hidden workers and if brands believe in transparency why not they have to announce the global supply chain list the outsourced ones let them not quote their uh, rates but at least that list can be out and the bank uh, details of these workers uh, lies into the hands of the brands directly and then we know how we can further move along with these even uh, the all india unorganized workers congress of which i am the national coordinator of home based workers we are now emphasizing on the healthcare system and training and pressurizing on the public health system also in the public distribution system for the food security this is the right time to focus on the unorganized in their hometowns registration and the membership of these the true membership of these home based workers can be found the, the they are losing their livelihoods there is lack of social production there is lack of social security there are various schemes in our country you know um, as 93% of the informal workers are there we know that they are 93% but what are we doing so as trade unions let's create awareness about the uh, corona let's create an app to reach out to them through pictures through voice messages through messages try to access food grains from the government to the people to create livelihood we can train the women workforce further we can see that they get more job in the manrega projects in india there are manrega has to be focused and active job card holders are around 7.65 crores in india on record i'm sure there may be off record also national food security act has to be administered through pds one uh, ration card should be made available and the secc survey in 2011 was able to guide the allocation of the government benefits also there is kisan samman yojana which is rupees 6000 per year an additional rupees 2000 should be given to these workers these vulnerable ones in the present crisis the central and state government should plan to make the crop insurance scheme simpler and easier for the home based agricultural workers as per the economic survey in india in 2016 17 for every five household there will be one household with at least one member who is migrant so what are we doing for these migrant workers challenges to employ the skilled migrant workers the skilled people the skilled workforce which is who are returning back to their hometown to the different federal state so the state governments can help in reviving and restoring the rural lives and uh, the economic empowerment of their small scale industries is a must and the uh, Uh, marginalized um, have to be looked forward to what uh, we uh, are requesting to the brands is to show their good labor standards procurement of brand is very important as they set the benchmark the brands have a moral ethical and social responsibility besides the corporate responsibility also we have lots of hope and trust um, on these brands and home based workers uh, women are locked down are imposed to these sufferings so i pray to these home uh, brands to look into this grave matter seriously thank you thank you so much anas for all your insights and highlighting the challenges that exist in the uh, in the hidden supply chain you know as we recognize it transparency gender child labor and there's so many of these that we also saw a lot of you given in your inputs um again that was really valuable what i will now request all of you to do is once more go to the slido.com or your slido app we have one more question for you over here and the key question here is 
Are you engaged in any program that protects the rights of home-based workers in the supply chain? Again, the same hashtag applies and you can continue with where you stopped last. Question is, are you engaged in any program that protects the rights of home-based workers in the supply chain? I will pause for a moment as I let you enter your thoughts. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your inputs. We have gathered the responses and I will share them towards the end as again. Well, with this, I'd like to turn to Lucy. Lucy, thank you for joining us once again. And, uh, you know, I would like to actually turn to you to really share with everyone that's joined us today, you know, the role of stakeholders so what is the role that stakeholders can play in mapping of home-based workers where we recognize transparency is a challenge as well as the best practices of mapping and managing home-based workers thank you okay um hello um thank you very much to natasha and to everyone at amphori for this opportunity to join you all today um, my name is Lucy Brill. Um, I work for an NGO that's based in the UK and um, that's been working for over 20 years now um, in support of home workers and their organisations in the struggle for rights and respect. Um, we're actually part of an EC funded programme at the moment that's um, about trying to improve working conditions for home workers in global supply chains in India, Pakistan and Nepal um, in apparel and footwear. Um, I'm going to talk today about some work we did a couple of years ago about that was about looking at home workers within footwear supply chains. Um, but I'm first, first of all, the first slide really is about why should um, CSR managers and um, people from global brands consider home working? Why is it an important issue? Um, so first of all, it's the prevalence of home working. It is a significant number of workers. Um, mainly women workers. So the latest figure from the ILO is that 11% of all women workers work in their own home. Um, I, because it's in the informal sector, it is difficult to measure, but estimates vary from between 100 and 300 million women work, well, workers, um, the majority of which are women. Um, it's also a really diverse phenomenon. I mean, I guess traditionally it's within garment manufacturing, um, leather footwear, um, but I mean, we found home workers in many different sectors. So home workers trimming rubber in the UK, home workers packing cards, home workers processing agricultural products, even making electronics um, or mechanical components. Um, so it's a very diverse phenomenon. Um, also, I think I think Shanaz made it clear home workers are likely to be some of the most vulnerable women workers in your supply chains. They're paid on a piece rate um, almost always, and their work is often distributed by intermediaries in the informal economy with very little transparency. Um, I think because the other important issues, because so many women, about up to 80 to 90 percent, it varies in different countries, obviously, um, but um, yeah, it's only in South Asia, 90 percent of home workers or even more are women. Um, so it's also a key part of a gender positive um, strategy um, for brands. And I think that's, it's really interesting. If you look at where women are in supply chains, they're at, they're at the most vulnerable, in the most vulnerable jobs, and they're also the main consumers. So I think there's important links there. Um, I guess, I, I mean, I was looking at the results from that question about risk and this big uh, child labor as a key risk. 
Um, and I guess what we would be saying is if you can encourage, you know, enable your suppliers to be transparent and to be more open with you, that is about re reducing risk. Um, that the main risk is when when suppliers are, are afraid and not able to, to disclose things, that increases the risk. And it also increases the vulnerability of the women because their work becomes even more hidden. Um, so if there was a, if there is a problem, they can't take any action. Um, I think that, I mean, the final point really is about um, retaining women within the workforce. I and mean, home home working is something that women often do when they're um, looking after children. Um, and I think for women's progression is a key issue for dealing with other gender issues within supply chains. Um, so I think if home-based work could be recognised and you know, organised in a responsible and decent way, it would be a way of retaining women workers within the workforce. Okay, so to move on to the work that we've been doing in leather footwear, I guess our interest in leather footwear came about because everywhere that we've mapped home working, so we've worked in Latin America, Eastern Europe and South Asia, um, we found home workers stitching leather uppers. Um, and it, it's as many home working tasks is labour intensive um, handwork. Um, it's also quite a good sector to start with because it's not as mobile as sewing and so it tends to be uh, in our experience shorter supply chains so easier to get um, to, to trace um, but as I've said before paid on a piece rate um, okay could I have the next slide please okay um, so we we did a lot of work um, documenting the conditions of home-based work and we then published a report in 2016 um, that, that and Asked, challenged quite a lot of the brands that we had contact with um, to respond to that report. Um, and one particular brand took the report to their supplier um, and, and I imagine said, I imagine this is a load of rubbish. Anyway, the supplier said, no, actually we do, we do use home workers for some of your shoes. Um, and and yeah, okay, we'll we'll work with you to try and um, try and look at how we can address the issue. Um, so we agreed, we then worked, I mean, the, the brand then came to us um, and we then worked with uh, an Indian NGO that we've been working with for many years and we agreed a, pro a, a protocol for working with the supplier and with the brand and with the, the four of us basically. So that trust building process was really important and it also takes quite a long time. I think that, you know, that's a key part that everybody needs to know what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And there was a, an, Clearly, there was a commitment from the brand to to get that supply chain working better. Um, it was an important product for them. Okay, um, so what we did then? Hang on, I think we're going very quickly. Sorry. Um, yeah. So in terms of mapping the supply chain, um, we traced um, the brand, the, the supplier introduced us to the different people involved in the process. We interviewed the agents. We interviewed home workers. We also did what we call value chain mapping, which was following specific shoe styles down the chain um, and, and enabling us to document really clearly the piece rate. And then the supplier was able to do a time and motion study to work out how far below the minimum wage the home workers' wages were. Um, okay, could we have the next slide, please? Next slide, okay. Okay, so this, this slide really is just looking at if a brand is concerned that homeworking might be within some of its supply chains, what, what does due diligence look like for brands? Um, so the first thing for us is that a brand should have a clear homeworker policy that if, because many brands do ban homeworking, I think in our experience, suppliers are really scared to talk to brands about, um, they might know that homeworkers are involved um, for some of their subcontractors, but they're very scared to talk about it. So we would say, if you have a clear policy that says it is okay, um, that we want you to disclose homeworking and work with us to manage it, um, that obviously enables them to talk about it. And then if you have a policy to raise it with your suppliers, to include it within your supply chain management com conversations with suppliers. Um, then the next stage is when suppliers do disclose, it's about encouraging them to be transparent and you often then, at that point, do you need to be looking for local civil society organisations or local trade unions to engage with the home workers and also the agents and intermediaries and 
unpacking that chain, understanding the roles of the different people. Um, and work, I mean, certainly in the leather chains, the intermediaries also had an important role to play. They were transporting the uppers from the factory to the work, to the women. They were also managing the work and they had a quality, they were involved in the quality. So that chain, the intermediaries too needed to be paid, need to be recognised and paid. I mean, that isn't always the case, I'm aware, um, but it's, it's that process of unpacking what is going on. Um, and then working with all the different stakeholders to look at what are the, the issues. There may be various issues um, and then agreeing how we're going to work together to address them. What is the priority? And I think there it is really important that the home workers are actively involved in that process. They are the most vulnerable people in that in in that process. Um, so I guess their priorities need to be need to be listened to and, and recognised. Um, I think the final point really is about including purchasing practices, including the brand's purchasing practices and seeking ways that the brand can use its purchasing power to um, get constructive solutions. So one, one of the brands that we've worked with, for example, had um, open book costings with their suppliers. They were able then to put a, um, to ring fence an additional premium for the home workers. Um, to, to increase their piece rates. Um, okay, so this is just some examples of the different things that, that um, suppliers can do to manage home working. So I guess the first, yeah, we've got agree a model of good employment, work out what does good look like. Um, so you're, you're documenting what's going on at the moment, and then you're working out how does this need to improve, where are the, where are the challenges. Um, I mean, there may be good practice you might find. I mean, certainly we've spoken to some brands that they have been able to work with suppliers to increase piece rates above. I mean, I've spoken to one supplier that was um, paying its its workers on a skilled minimum wage rate, which was brilliant. Um, OK, so um, I mean, there were simple systems that, that we've worked with the supplier in the leather footwear chain um, to document the home workers work. So a job card system to report to record how many shoes were given to this to each home worker and what the piece rate is so that the home worker knows what they're taking on and can agree to it um, and it's also there's a there's a there's a record there um, i think it also recognizing that this process of change requires support from all the different parties that is and, and as i said before recognizing the the roles of each person um, and, and, and there may be a training need there um, so that people, I mean, if you're going to introduce a job card system, that is something new that people have got to be able to do. There may be maybe issues of literacy. Um, and it's also, I think, look at what, what's quite interesting with looking at could mobile phones be used in that process? Um, I think, as I've said before, including the home workers as active partners in that process is really important. Um, and that's also about access to grievance. I think you can have the most brilliant um, job card system, but if, if the home workers can be, you know, don't have access to grievance, they can be made to sign anything. So I think you do need, you need both um, things. I think also the final point about leverage, um, that's, that is really important that, that oftentimes, especially with smaller brands, um, it, they will need to be teaming up with other people. You've, sometimes the agent is taking work from two or three factories, and the factory may well have worked from two or three brands. So again, it's that kind of, it's trying to get um, coordination across a sector. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, this is, yeah, this, this is the final slide really is coming back to some of the points that were raised um, by Shanaz really, um, but the, the impact of COVID-19, I think it is really obvious because home workers are so informal and because they're not, they're not recognised as workers. So even the limited support that, that, that governments in, in the Global South have been able to provide for, for workers that are formally employed, um, those very rarely reach the home workers. Um, obviously the factory is, is struggling to survive and to pay its, its factory workers. It's even less likely to pay its subcontractors and home workers. Um, and they're also, because they're informal, they're rarely entitled to social protection. So again, they don't have access to um, health care or, um, or social security. Um, so that is a real vulnerability. Um, I think 
I mean, the lockdown in, in, in many countries is also making it really difficult for them to use informal methods to get their um, to get money that they may be owed. So they can't go out and find the intermediary, give him hassle, which is what they would traditionally be doing. Um, so, yeah, I think. And then the final thing is being obviously if there's a lockdown um, in very small houses with lots of people, there's an increased risk of domestic violence and abuse. So, I mean, it is this is a really important area of work um, so thank you thank you so much lucy for sharing with us those details you know particularly with regards to the mapping exercise the due diligence requirements as well as the impacts of the current crisis and the challenges that we see mm -hmm. uh, with this i would actually like to turn to jean uh, Jane, thanks for joining us once again. And if I could call upon you to, you know, highlight how buyers, uh, you know, can assure producers of their commitment towards a continuous improvement uh, program and how producers can be enabled to manage home-based work. Over to you, Jane. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha. And and Mvori for including us in this in this today. And thanks also, Shanaz and Lucy, for your really valuable points that you've made and for so clearly establishing why we need to be working with home workers and in particular why it's important to focus on supporting them right now through the COVID crisis, which is having a tremendous effect on the most vulnerable. I'm gonna quickly cover a few slides today. First of all, starting by giving you an introduction to Goodweave, who we are and what we do, and then I'll walk you through our system, how we address this issue of promoting decent working conditions for home-based workers, and walk you through our, our supply chain assurance process and give a short case study. And then I'll wrap up with some recommendations for you based on our experience in terms of how you can best support home workers as brands. So Goodweave. Goodweave's mission is to end child labor in global supply chains. Um, and we see addressing adult circumstances as central to our approach. So we have a strong focus on decent work principles in our standard. And we apply the standard to all tiers of production, starting at the tier one factories and going all the way down to the home workers. We also prioritize forced and bonded labor investigations and remediation. We were started 25 years ago um, to attack the issue of child labor in the carpet sector. And over the years, we've rescued almost 8,000 child laborers and presented, prevented tens of thousands more from being exploited. And over these 25 years, we've developed a proven approach to end child labor and forced and bonded labor. We are a full member of the ICL Alliance and, and maintain ISO 65 accreditation, and we have a global team and presence on the ground. We have a team in the US where our secretariat is located here in the EU where I'm located um, and then in Asia our field teams on the ground are located in Afghanistan, Nepal and India and our biggest office is in India where we have four field offices, 81 full-time staff and then another about 90 community, community facilitators working in production communities around India. We started working in the carpet industry as I said but we've recently begun to expand. We now certify products in home textiles and we're working in apparel and fashion jewelry and through our capacity building unit working in the tea and brick sectors and other sectors providing support on our methodology. I'm trying to change to the next slide. Could you help me, Natasha? Thank you. And our approach is based on five pillars. The first is harnessing market forces. That means we start with partnerships with brands. Um, to create a market for goods made without child labor that are good we've certified and labeled. And this relationship with the brands provides leverage in supply chains to change behaviors and practices permanently. We've got 171 brand partners right now, including a few M4 members, including Target, Auto, and CNA. We then connect through these brands with their suppliers to create transparent supply chains. And we apply our standard, which you can find on our website, we'll show the link at the end, to these supply chains and verify compliance by continuously mapping and inspecting factories, work sites, and facilities, all the way down to small village subcontractors and individual homes. And we believe in inspections that are random, unannounced, and quite frequent. And this leads us to finding these exploited children and workers, and also serves as a deterrent to bad labor practices. 
Right now we're monitoring about 5,000 work sites and we've rescued over time 7,600 children from child labor directly. The next crucial pillar that we think is really important is access to education. So we have social programs, they serve victims, address the root causes of child labor, often both of those things. And in each country where we operate, we tailor the, innovation, the intervention to the context. So in India, we use the child-friendly community model where we work to strengthen local educational institutions, provide bridge schooling for children and literacy for adults. And we monitor and support all the at-risk children in the community to ensure that they are able to go to school and barriers to education are removed. Um, right now we're providing um, 36,000 children quality education support for that. And in India, we have 54 active child-friendly communities. The next pillar is improving conditions for all workers. One important part of the equation is ensuring obviously that adult workers are better compensated and better treated within their workplaces and in their home environments. And we are currently reaching almost 80,000 workers in supply chains. Um, that was the 2019 number and that includes many, many thousands of home workers. And lastly, we're working in these specific product areas, but we're also working to encourage and promote replication. We've recently established a capacity building unit to provide training on our system in additional sectors. And one example is a recent Rainforest Alliance partnership in tea, where we work to develop risk models around child labor and tea plantations and trained auditors from five firms on how to inspect and monitor child labor. Now I'll move to a specific example. Thank you. Um, this diagram of deep supply chain mapping was done by Goodweave in three sectors, and this represents one year of work with a small sampling of eight British brands, which are most of these were smaller brands, and they were brought on through a program sponsored by the Modern Slavery Innovation Fund from the UK Home Office. With these eight brands, we were able to access 25 exporters in India. And you can see that's in the second level there, the second level. The primary facilities associated with these suppliers um, all subcontract to a network of smaller suppliers and, and producers who in turn subcontract about production in many cases to homeworks in the communities that you see in the squares in the bottom. And here's what we see when we initially engage with brands. Co companies are often aware of their tier one suppliers and not of the hidden supply chain. This can be because their policies don't allow subcontracting, which as Lucy pointed out, makes it even, tends to hide it even more. And there are companies that allow homework, homework, but the auditing and monitoring of subcontracting is not within scope of their audit programs. And when you don't have presence on the ground near these facilities, it's impossible to keep eyes on what's actually happening in supply chains. Um, so what we do is we start by mapping the full supply chain, but we don't stop. We also identify and address the risks within it. We start by um, monitoring against our robust standard um, using local inspectors, always our own inspectors on the ground that understand the situation on the ground. And through that, we're able to build relationships with suppliers that are business friendly and support the development of these suppliers' own management systems and work conditions. With that, we then offer remediation of issues found with particular expertise in child labor and risk factors for forced and bonded labor. So just the, the overall impact of working with these eight smaller brands that then worked sourced from 25 suppliers, we were able to reach 7,400 workers, and we were able to support 2,400 children that were at risk of child labor by ensuring that they had access to education. And I'll make one last point on, on this slide before I move on, um, which is just that this diagram is sort of neat and orderly, but it's important to know, if you don't, that supply chains are really not static. They change often. Um, and we retain records we, we we geotag with our with our platform to ensure that that we have accurate and up-to-date coverage of the workers linked to one producer because it changes weekly monthly um who's who's tied to which supply chain and it's really important to keep an accurate record of that and keep that data current so let's take a deeper dive into one retailer's hidden supply chain this is an example of a partnership with a discount retailer in this case in the carpet sector. When we started work with them, what they knew was that they had five direct suppliers audited regu regularly through their own program. And that's all they knew.
Working with us and with deep and ongoing supply chain mapping, we uncovered 987 subcontracting units, including many, many home looms. And those subcontracting units are now monitored and have oversight on a regular basis. Other uh, results of this partnership, um, the regular inspections against our standard highlighted child exploitation and other issues. And as always, a remediation plan was worked out and implemented with the suppliers. This particular retail also embedded our child protection policy, which you can also find on our website, and adjusted its requirements, its own requirements to make them stronger as a result of our work together, thereby improving the whole supply chain. And I guess I'll make one last point on that slide. I just want to raise the point that the suppliers themselves, the exporters, generally don't have this level of visibility themselves through subcontracting. They know who they're subcontracting to, but they really almost never know where, where the further tiers are located. And so generally we find that this information becomes very useful to suppliers um, as well as to the brands, of course. Okay, so now, now to the recommendations. So now, based on our experience in the ground and a little bit of what I showed in these case studies, I want to share some key recommendations that we believe brands should consider when they want to ensure decent working conditions. And 15 minutes of time or five minutes that I think I have left isn't really enough to get into detail. So I'll speak quickly at a very high level. Um, the first thing that needs to be considered is that corporate policies allowing home-based work need to be implemented. If it's not allowed, it will be hidden. Beyond just setting the standards, it's also crucial to have a corporate commitment to acknowledging informal work and have suppliers ready to commit to full disclosure. And they need to trust that they won't be penalized for that. Then you have to have a clear standard set up that will verify these labor conditions. And this needs to be really clearly communicated to your supplier partners. It's really important to balance strong requirements for no child labor and forced labor along ensuring real-time remediation. And you need to have guidelines for continuous improvement to stimulate improvement over time and ensure that parents and adults have access to the decent work and can afford to send their children to school. So once standards are set, the supply chain mapping needs to start um, to uncover these hidden um, layers of the supply chain. And to do this, you need to establish an effective assurance system, which includes ongoing supply chain mapping. And to do this, you have to build trust with suppliers and workers to access and share information. When you work with suppliers together to remediate issues rather than dropping them or finding them when non-compliances are uncovered, they do become more willing over time to work with you. And it's really important to meaningfully collect and use the data to identify where your risks are, where the hotspots are. We've developed an online platform, which I referenced earlier, the Supply Chain Transparency Platform, that allows us to do this and our inspectors capture data on tablets, which allows us to actually pinpoint physically the locations where problems are occurring and the regions that are occurring. The inspection and monitoring protocols have to be particularly clear when you're working with home workers. It's a fluid environment. They need to include random and unannounced inspections, we believe, by teams in proximity to supply chains. And these inspectors need to be have clear instructions on how to conduct inspections at all tiers of production because the techniques need to be quite different when you're working with home workers. When we've done benchmarking with existing audit frameworks, we've seen that these protocols are really very rarely developed for home workers. They, they stop if they go to the tier two factories, that's, um, they always stop there, they, they rarely go further. And lastly, you need to have the capacity and any inspectors that are working in the supply chain need to have, must have the capacity when working with home workers to address cases of non-compliance on the spot, particularly when you're talking about issues of child labor. Next, remediation. As I just mentioned, it's really important to act quickly when you're, when you're talking about child labor or other serious labor rights violations but that has to be combined with a medium and long-term corrective plan put in place to prevent recurrence. And the brand should always try to work with the supplier to remediate the issue. Walking away from the supplier when issues are uncovered is not a solution and worsens home-based worker conditions across the, word, across, across the board. Also, 
we have to remember that suppliers are not expert at remediation and they need support, which is why connecting with a credible local partner is key. And these partners need to be mapped out in advance as a part of the strategy. And lastly, to really ensure decent working conditions for home-based workers, the root causes need to be addressed. Um, this includes when you're talking about issues of child labor, which is very important to us, building social norms and communities against child labor, as well as promoting rights and better working conditions for adults. This can take the form of education programs, rights awareness and skills development for workers in the supply chain, as well as has been highlighted already, um, health checks and access to support and for, for health and safety, which is especially crucial right now. We're focused right now on delivering health information and PPE to these most, most vulnerable workers and have set up a fund to make sure that we can reach as many home workers as we can to make sure this important and crit critical information is conveyed to them. And on to the last slide, um, which is partnership models. For anyone who wants to learn more about working with us, we have three types of partnerships. The first is certification for carpets and home textiles. The next is supply chain assurance for apparel and fashion jewelry. And lastly, as I mentioned, we're building out our own capacity to do capacity building. We're finalizing some trainings to share knowledge and build capacity with other organizations based on our system to eradicate child labor and, and ensure decent rights for home-based workers. Ensuring decent rights for home-based workers is a crucial part of this. Um, so thank you for listening to me today. I hope I didn't talk too fast. And I'm um, on the last slide, you'll see my contact information. We're open to support brands and supply chain assurance issues down to the home base level. And please feel free to get in touch with us. We cross a, a number of different geographies and time zones. So I can make sure to put you in touch with the right person if you'd like to follow up. And I'm ready to answer questions now. Great, thank you so much, Jean. Um, and you know, with this, we come to an end uh, to the contributions that our speakers have to make. But we do open for questions and answers. And I do encourage all of you to type in your questions. We will be very happy to address them. Um, as we check for more questions that potentially come in, I, I go back to what I promised to share with you at the outset, and that is the results of the questions and the polls that we had. So for those of you that have not seen it on the app yet, um, I am looking at it right now on my phone. And I will I would love to share that, you know, for the question that we first asked, are you aware of home-based workers in your supply chain? 41% uh, of you answered yes, 26% no, and 33% not sure. And that's really um, also the, uh, you know, the, the, the gap area, you know, of, of uh, not being sure. That's typically where the largest transparency risks lie. So, yes, it would be good to go back and do some due diligence in, in this area. The next question we asked you was, what risks do you associate with home-based workers in your supply chain? And our speakers did highlight a lot of these, but I also add in what you shared with us. Um, it was a really nice word diagram for those of you that saw it on your screen. Uh, the key things we had right at the center, really in the core with the maximum number of inputs was child, child exploitation, child labor, which you know our speakers uh, also highlighted. Um, working hours, um, you know, um, wages, no way to verify uh, and and really track uh, uh, the conditions in in this supply chain, uh, which goes down below the tiers all the way down to the home based workers. Security for the workers, um, social security, um, and and a lot of inputs on wages also, which are which are recognized. Um, and then for the third question that we asked you, uh, are you engaged in any program that protects the rights of home-based workers in the supply chain? 20% uh, of you answered yes, 65% of you answered no, and 15% not sure. So with this, I'd like to once again thank you for all your inputs uh, to the questions, and I hope you know they trigger some thoughts for you on your end also as you listen to what our speakers have additionally shared. Uh, we do have one question that I, I see and I would be very happy to take it up. 
um, the question here is how to decide a fair piece rate. Um, uh, Michelle asks this question. Uh, Michelle, I don't see any particular speaker that you have directed this question to. So perhaps I will, you know, uh, let the speakers in turn, um, you know, provide any inputs that they have in this regard. Perhaps we start with you, Shanaz, uh, any perspective on how do we decide a fair piece rate? It's very difficult. It totally depends on the contractor. It depends on what rate the raw materials is brought by, he gets, and then he sublets it to the agent. And at what rate the agent gets it, and at what rate he gives it to the subcontractor and the petty contractors, and then the home based workers get the raw materials. So, the more lower the piece rate is, the uh, man, the agent, the middleman earns the most. So, he always tries, he or she always tries to suppress the piece rate of these home based workers. And there comes the role again of child labor entering into this field because in most of the cases like rug industry and carpet industry as Jean was talking about, we find child labor because they add on to the income of the family and then there comes the role of the these child labor. The entire family gets involved into it because they want to increase their income as the piece rate is very, very low. So it is very difficult for uh, any one of us to know that what is the actual piece rate. And as these home-based workers are invisible, nobody knows about them. No, uh, only the uh, contractor and the subcontractor and the petty ones and the agent who reaches them, he's the one who knows actually, not even the subcontractor. So the home-based workers are, are, are at the last rank. So the man who reaches out to these home-based uh, home workers are only aware of this piece rate worker because the value is added to their income, you know, to their profits. He takes the most, the one who is at the highest end. It is very difficult, very difficult. And that's what we want the transparency for. That's what we want to ignore this middleman. <clears throat> and it can only be possible when there will be visibility of these home-based workers, when they will be counted as, when they come under the purview of the workers. They don't come under the purview of the workers yet. We are demanding for it. We are talking about Convention 177. We are demanding for it. They don't come under the purview of workers. So how can we decide or how can uh, we know about the peace rate also? You won't believe in Lucknow where our team works, uh, they work for uh, those uh, hand-woven um, ready-made garments for the uh, local Indian market. Just two doors ahead, the rate per piece rate is 5 rupees or 6 rupees more than two doors back. It also depends on the skill also. The, uh, the way the home-based workers are manufacturing. Sorry. Yeah. Shanaz, I I'm sorry, no, I, I, I know I recognize that, and I actually think you have given quite a few factors in there that define the piece rate. Uh, the only reason, please allow me, uh, is also because we do have now some questions that have also come in uh, for Jean, uh, as as well as you know, I'd like Lucy to give in her perspective uh, on the same if she she'd like. So I'll share the next question, and you know, uh, Jean, it's in particular directed to you but then Lucy you could also add in perspective uh, on the same um, so the question is I am uh, interested about decent work in your standards um, but really the overarching general question is how would you define decent work and and for this definition I'd, I'd open it first to Jane and then to Lucy thank you sure I, I would think I would say that most standards that define decent work follow the ILO guidance on decent work, um, which is also similar to, to the, the ETI base code. So for, for very specific definitions, that's where I would look and that's what our standard is based on. Decent work is obviously work that provides a decent income, that provides security where workers' are, safety is protected, where they have a voice, where they can um, 
where they have access to grievance mechanism, where they have all the things that we've been discussing earlier. Decent work encompasses all of those things. And I'd also like to say that time and motion, I want to just mention time and motion study for, for the last question, like when, for the question about, about a, a, like, like setting a piece rate, I would just say that the most simple thing to do is, is, is do a time and motion study and then follow up with workers to make sure that the, the amount specified in a time and motion study is actually being paid to them. So it's a two-step process. And I'll hand it to Lucy. Thank you, Jean. Lucy, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. I think I would, in turn, I, if I turn to the fair piece rate, rate question, I would agree the time of motion study. I mean, I think there were there were two different ways really that we have done it in the past. Um, so yeah, doing a time of motion study that needs to be done, being careful to take account of the conditions that home workers are working in. So there may well be, say for example, if work is transported in a big bundle, there might be a task that needs to be done that's different to what happens in a factory, in terms of unpacking, sorting the work out before you start. Um, and also making sure you add in times for, I mean, I think the danger with a time motion study is you measure a worker that stitches one pair of shoes and she can do that in 15 minutes, say, but you don't bear in mind that if she's going to be stitching shoes all day, she will need to take break, break, breaks if she doesn't want to get RSI in her shoulders, for example. Um, so it's making sure that the time motion study adds in. Um, I mean, there is we were involved, I guess, to turn to the decent work question, um, we were involved in the ETI program in the early 2000s, which was about working out how do you apply the ETI base code to home workers. Um, so the ETI did set agree a set of guidelines that's, you know, that, that includes things like how do you set a fair piece rate, but also, you know, what does transparency look like? What are what are the different systems that you can use to record home workers' work to reduce the kind of the dangers of the exploitation that Shanaz is talking about? Um, you know, if there is no transparency, if everything is just word of mouth, then you know they might you might agree a piece rate at the beginning of the week, and then at the next, you know, when the guy comes back next week, he's going to give you half the money, and you can't really prove that it was anything different if you've got something written down. Obviously, there is some, you know, some scope to take action, though I think, as I said before, access to grievance is also really important if that's going to be enforceable. The, the women need to, you know, if the guy says, well, look, you signed it wrong, you know, you wrote it wrong, um, you need somewhere that, the, the, that people can go um, in order to challenge that. Um, yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, we have one last question, um, and I apologize, we're probably running a couple of minutes late, but it is an interesting question. So if I would uh, request our um, you know, speakers to stay with us, and as well as for the audience that uh, would find value in this question. Um, and it really is about, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost it here. Bear with me a moment. Okay, so it's a, it's a question which says, is it possible for the brand to set up direct business relation with home-based workers and set up an ideal minimum piece wage rate instead of going through the middle agent? Would that be a solution? <laughs> Open to all our panelists, because I think <laughs> this is something that, um, you know, I, I can see all of you have thoughts to share. So perhaps we start with you, Lucy, and then Jean, and end with you, Shanaz. Okay. I mean, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it is a really, it's an interesting question. It's a very attractive question. Um, I think it comes down to, well, well, I guess my response would be, if you're mapping the supply chain, it's understanding what are the roles that the different people are playing in that supply chain. Um, so if there are intermediaries who are basically just taking a cut, well, clearly they can be cut out of the supply chain. Um, however, but it often is not always so simple. Um, so, I mean, if you're dealing with a situation where you've got women that are a long distance away from the factory, uh, possibly they're in a, a context when they cannot jump on a motorbike and go and collect the work from, a, you know, they've got small children at home, or maybe for culture, they haven't got access to a motorbike. They don't, you know, there, there are lots of reasons there may be cultural norms that make it very difficult for them to do that. So I think it's not to say it's impossible, but I think you do need to understand the various, the, the different tasks and roles that need to be factored into doing that. Um, I think, I mean, there have, there are, there are NGOs that are setting up 
um, cooperatives. Uh, and I think it's different. Well, I suppose what our position would be really is that it's more about we, we wouldn't want to be moving work from one group of home workers to another group of home workers. I think it's about improving the conditions for the home workers that are in existing chains, um, which is about working with supply with the with the setup that there is, um, and then making sure that people are paid properly. Um, and that would be intermediaries. If the intermediaries are doing an important job, then they will need to be paid properly. Certainly in the leather footwear example that I spoke about before, the intermediaries were not being paid separately. And so they had to take their own wages. Now that's not to say, obviously some of them will be taking more than they should be, um, but they, they need to be paid as well. So um, yeah, it's, about, it's about transparency and recognizing roles. So. Thanks Lucy. Over to you, Jean. Yeah, no, I agree with Lucy 100% on all of that. I mean, it needs to start with transparency and understanding the full supply chain and seeing there are there are occasions, there's certainly instances where the intermediary isn't playing a very valuable role or that role could be divided amongst other players in the supply chain and that value divided, but it all starts with understanding the flow of the product. Um, and where cooperatives can be formed and workers can be organized, that's always ideal, but it's not always possible. And I agree with Lucy that we need to meet workers where they are and not take work away from any workers that are currently part of the supply chain, but just make it better for them. Thank you, Jean. Some very important points here. You know, it's really about working with the uh, supply hidden supply chain that's already identified and uplifting their lifestyle. Shanaz, over to you for your last comments. We literally have 30 seconds, but all yours. In this question, I totally 110% agree with Lucy and Jean. If this question is answered, the entire problem will be solved. So what is very important is right, very rightly said by Lucy, mapping. Yes, there should be transparency and mapping of supply chain. Second important thing to be followed should be the redressal mechanism. Third should be trainings of manpowers, of suppliers, mm -hmm. of producers. Hell lot of trainings and awareness and advocacy uh, about home-based workers to them. And then one thing that uh, I would like to suggest that the brand should at least uh, go for a third party regulatory mechanism. Maybe they can have somebody from the trade union or CSOs or NGOs who can look into the legal dimensions, into the actual rules and regulations and form some regulatory mechanism to check all of these. And uh, this can be a hidden mechanism of the brands besides, you know, so maybe it will click on and it can work if a third party regulatory mechanism is being associated. Thank you. The quick keywords here, uh, mapping, grievance mechanism, training, third party checks, you know, and working with local collaboration to really know what's happening on ground. That's great, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, you wonderful ladies, for all your insights and all the valuable experience, you know, you shared with us and the audience today. And I hope all of you joining us have found value in this session and have some thoughts that you take away with you as we call it a close. Thank you very much once again and I wish all of you a wonderful day ahead and a wonderful week that lies ahead. Stay safe, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>